over us, your presence surrounds us, and still we stare in shock and relief when your holy love is made known to us. We confess that we have rejected the call to radical love, the same call that sent Jesus to the cross. We confess our fear of how this love will remake our world because we cannot envision it. So we cling to what is known. We cling to our fear, our hopelessness, and our selfishness. Lord, we confess that we have not been the powerful witnesses to your love that you have called us to be. We have hurt others with our words and our actions. We have been inactive when we have, should have spoken and moved. And we have turned away from those in our communities who are in the most need. Holy One, we lift up to you now these confessions and all those lingering in the silence of our hearts. Loving God, forgive us and remake our hearts, make them new. Prepare us to be your sanctuary. Pour your love into us so that we may pour it back out into the world. Receive this good news, church. God receives all of our confessions, all our prayers, and we have been forgiven, and our sins have been wiped out. As a forgiven people, let us answer God's call to be witnesses of God's transforming love today and every day. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. of love, God of life, we come to you today with hearts and minds bustling with so many things. We come here to be refreshed, Lord, to have our fragile hearts mended, for so often they crack and break when they collide with the hardness of this world. The splinters of our hearts litter the ground like the buds from the spring trees when we are confronted with all in this world that hurts, that burdens us, and makes us question. And yet, even in our hurt and disbelief, God, you are there, working miracles before us, bringing life out of death strengthening our spirit and our faith so that we might endure and one day thrive. And so we lift our voices to you, O Lord, as we pray for our world and for this community. God, we lift up all who are in need of your healing touch this day for wounds of the mind, the body, and the spirit, for the sick, the healing, and the hurting. God, we especially pray for Ray Cliff and Jerry Shermeyer, who are in need of your healing, Lord. Lay your hands on them and be with them. We pray for Candy Crawford as she continues treatment. Give your strength and your hope. 
And we pray for Lori Wren, who is in hospice care. God, wrap your comforting arms around her and make your presence known to her. Lord, we pray for all who are missing loved ones that have passed, whose hearts hurt at the empty spaces in life that cannot be filled, not in the same way. God, we give thanks and we pray for Joanne Ginger and Ryan Orario, who have decorated your table with flowers in memory of their mother, Teresa, whom they love and miss. Fill them with words of comfort and joyful memories, Lord. Lord, we pray for all in this world who are suffering from homelessness, hunger, and so many other injustices. We pray for the communities that are hurting because of violence and systems of oppression, especially for those communities in and near Minneapolis and Chicago. Daily you transform this world, O oh God, and we ask that you bring love and transformation into these inequalities, these systems of violence and oppression, and you remake the world in your image, Lord. We see evidence of that transformation every day. We give you thanks for the smiling faces that bask in the sunlight, for the sound of children playing in the park, and the blessing of spring as flowers bloom and trees finally sprout their leaves after such a long winter. You bring newness into the world. You refresh it daily with your spirit. Refresh and renew us, O oh Lord. We offer all these prayers of thanks and concerns to you with our words, and we offer even more now in the silence of our hearts. Lord, we know you hold all of these prayers, that you have listened to them each with love and with care. Your presence is made known in this space as we gather to pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Katherine Curtis, and one of the best decisions our family made as new church members was to attend Tower Hill Weekend. Our family has been attending Tower Hill Camp for 18 years, and some of the photos that you're about to see will show you just how long that's been. We have special memories of our daughter camping for the first time at Tower Hill. In fact, Tower Hill has a special place in the heart of our entire congregation. With the exception of last summer, 
For decades each July, members and friends have spent a weekend at Tower Hill Camp. Strangely enough, Tower Hill Camp is one of two UCC Illinois Conference camps, but is not located in Illinois. Rather, it's in southwestern Michigan on the shores of Lake Michigan, adjacent to Warren Dune State Park. Tower Hill Camp is named after the Tower Hill Dune, the tallest dune at Warren Dunes, that rises 236 feet above ground level, which is roughly 20 stories high. Hiking through the interpretive nature trails at Tower Hill, you can breathe deeply the scent of the white pines and learn about the different types of dunes. The property hosts furry and feathered creatures such as wild turkeys with their chicks and small herds of deer. One special trail crosses a bridge over a creek and takes you up one direction towards a mud wall that is temptingly cool and irresistible to all ages who paint themselves in the mud for a Tower Hill mud mask. If you follow the creek and trail west, it will take you to the sand dunes in the beach on Lake Michigan, where Tower Hill has its own private beach. This walk is about 15 minutes long. Beach time can be spent playing in the water, building sand castles and digging moats, burying your friends up to their necks in sand, sunning and tanning, wakeboarding and swimming, and just hanging out. You never know what might happen on the beach at Tower Hill. Church member Kathy Basso even heard her call to serve our congregation as a staff member while chatting on the beach. At the end of beach time, folks head back to their lodgings or the campground for hot showers and dinner. The campground has a bathhouse with running water and indoor plumbing. That's a huge plus. Folks can fix their own meals over the campfire or in their lodgings, or they can take the weekend off from cooking and get takeout food from the many local eateries or enjoy catered box meals organized by Tower Hill Camp. After dinner, there are lots of fun options. Walk back down to the beach for a beautiful sunset, hike over to Warren Dunes to climb Tower Hill, enjoy a family-friendly ghost story around the campfire, or go stargazing. Our family still talks about seeing planets shining so brightly one night that they were reflected in the waters of Lake Michigan. Throughout the weekend, folks also enjoy activities such as playing on the playground, hammocking, which has reached an elevated art form between the trees of Tower Hill, and hanging out at the campground to do games, crafts, and make and eat s'mores, and share conversation around the campfire. I have a fond memory of our two-year-old daughter chatting, not with, but chatting to Mrs. Flugel for one whole evening. The final day of the weekend, we celebrate God and give thanks in the outdoor chapel of trees up on the hill where the cross is located. Worship doesn't look quite the same as it does in our sanctuary, and we wouldn't have it any other way. This year, our Tower Hill weekend will be set up a little differently, but we invite you to join us July 23rd to the 25th this year. See if you can come up for the day for the weekend or for worship, followed by a picnic and beach and nature time. For more information, check your Thursday church email, and we hope to see you all there this July. Peter and John. Jesus' disciples are going to the temple to pray when they encounter a man who cannot walk, a man who spends his days begging for alms just outside the temple gate. Peter, in Jesus' name, heals the man in front of a crowd of witnesses and then addresses them with the words that we are about to hear. In his speech, his sermon, Peter refers to Jesus as the author of of life. It's a bold claim, to be sure, one of cosmic significance. Jesus is more than just a nice guy with some good ideas. He's the Word of God made flesh, love incarnate, nothing less than the creative power of the universe itself. But Christ, 
for all of his power and majesty is not above human concerns. When Peter heals the man who cannot walk, he reminds us that love is what makes this created universe live and breathe. And we are called to help each other because we are all part of the same story written by the author of life. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts Uh, chapter 3, verse 12 through 21. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by your own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness. And by faith in his name, his name itself, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed to you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration of God, that announced, that God announced a long ago through his holy prophets. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, author of life, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It's a very humbling experience walking into a library or a bookstore, surrounded by thousands of books, millions of pages, billions of words, rivers of endless knowledge. A person cannot help but realize how little they really know. I get a similar feeling from looking at the modest bookshelf in my office, filled with texts that I've only dabbled in or used for reference. It's true that I possess an almost encyclopedic knowledge of some subjects, but the detailed history of 80s rock music isn't especially useful for a preacher. And at the end of the day, I have to admit that there's just a whole lot that I don't know, a whole lot that I've never learned and never will. Nonetheless, I enjoy libraries and bookstores a great deal. Swimming in that vast sea of books, I am humbled, it's true, but I am also filled with a sense of wonder and curiosity, imagining all of the stories and knowledge that lie in wait on those shelves. I seldom have the time to read as much as I would like to, but I'd really like nothing more than to be locked inside Barnes & Noble for a year, dining on Starbucks croissants and coffee and reading to my heart's content. I mean, it's not Dunkin' Donuts, but I'll take what I can get. The author, Haruki Murakami, depicts something a bit like this in his novel Kafka on the Shore. Here in this story, a young runaway lands a job in a small library in a seaside town. He actually lives there uh, for a while at the library and he spends most of his time reading whatever book he happens to grab off the shelf. History, fiction, 
philosophy, science, whatever. And there's something oddly compelling reading a book about someone else reading a book. It almost makes you wonder if someone else is at this very moment reading a book about you, leafing through its yellowing pages, a story written by an author of unknown provenance. The author of life, that's what Peter calls Jesus in this text from the book of Acts. It's a curious choice of words. The actual word Peter uses in the original Greek text is archegos, which is more typically translated as a leader or a prince, not so much an author as an authority. Though it goes without saying that those two words, author and authority, share the same etymology. Peter is describing Jesus here in cosmic terms, the catalyst, the spark, the origin of life itself, its source and its master, its author and its authority. The writer of the human story and other stories, perhaps, that we will never know. Jesus, the man, is so humble and quite literally down to earth that we sometimes forget what he really was. Jesus was God's attempt to cross the cosmic gulf that separates the creator from its creation, divinity from humanity. And while God is also imminent and in us and a part of us, that gulf is nonetheless vast. Its furthest reaches so far beyond our comprehension that it cannot even be imagined much less understood or described. The universe is a big place. A couple years ago, Elon Musk launched a Tesla Roadster into outer space, as you may recall. The publicity stunt was inspired by the 1981 animated sci-fi film Heavy Metal, in which the opening credits feature an astronaut driving a 1960 Chevy Corvette across the stars the tune of a song by Don Felder, also called Heavy Metal. Now, personally, I think Sammy Hagar's I Can't Drive 55 would have been a better choice, but at least old Sammy still ended up on the movie's soundtrack. Guess that rock and roll trivia comes in handy in the pulpit, after all. Anyway, this is all to say that I was watching a YouTube video with my son Levi not long ago about the sheer scale of the known universe. And taking a cue from Elon Musk, it imagined how long it would take to drive a car to the moon if you were going 60 miles per hour. Because when you're driving to the moon, you can't drive 55. Anyway, I learned that it would take about six months to drive to the moon. That's a pretty long haul. But the video doesn't stop there. The narrator goes on to calculate the distance to Mars, a little over 200 years. Jupiter, Pluto, well beyond the confines of our solar system. And by the time the car leaves the Milky Way galaxy, it's been traveling for billions of years. Incalculable distances across the vast gulfs of outer space. The author H.P. Lovecraft famously wrote that we live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it is not meant that we should voyage far. Someday the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Lovecraft believed that the universe is at best indifferent to humanity and at worst malevolent. We may be tempted to call that space that surrounds us empty and uncaring because it's devoid of human life or any life that we know of. But those distant reaches of the universe are filled with beauty. Shimmering stars, nebulas bursting with colors, burning suns that dwarf our own, and a diversity of planets the likes of which cannot be imagined, all of it composed by the author of life. Maybe the universe itself is alive, humming 
with divine energy, or as I like to call it, love. You see, this is not an amoral universe that we occupy, as some would believe. It is not a cold, uncaring place for all of its seemingly alien vastness. That's what Jesus came to tell us, that we are loved, and that we are called to love one another because that love is, quite literally, what makes the world go round. Whenever I set foot in a library, I'm reminded of the short story, The Library of Babel, by the surrealist author, George Luis Borges. Now in this bizarre writing, he describes an infinite library that is synonymous with the whole universe, a place where whole societies live and die, where mad prophets dream up their own religions, and where intrepid pilgrims venture into distant, uncharted aisles in search of holy books. The universe, which others call the library, he writes, is composed of an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries, the vast air shafts between surrounded by very low railings. From any of the hexagons, one can see, interminably, the upper and lower floors. Light is provided by some spherical fruits which bear the name of lamps. There are two in each hexagon. The light they emit is insufficient, incessant. In Borges' ruminations on the library, he describes various attempts to find meaning in its sprawling collection of texts. You see, most of them are completely indecipherable, random combinations of all possible letters and languages. It is true that the most ancient men, the first librarians, he muses, used a language quite different from the one we now speak. It is true that a few miles to the right, the tongue is dialectical, and that 90 floors farther up, it is incomprehensible. Borges writes of various cults and sects that have sprung up in the library, some of them believing in a sacred book that lies at the heart of the place, a cipher that will make sense of all the gibberish. He writes of desperate men who go in search of it, never to return. A blasphemous sect, the narrator recalls, suggested that the searches should cease and that all men should juggle letters and symbols until they constructed by an improbable gift of chance these canonical books. The authorities were obliged to issue severe orders. The sect disappeared, but in my childhood, I have seen old men who for long periods of time would hide in the latrines with some metal discs in a forbidden dice cup and feebly mimic the divine disorder. Friends, the library is, in its final analysis, a place devoid of both meaning and purpose. It is an amoral universe. Its inhabitants crave answers to the fundamental questions of existence, but they are left to their own devices. For them, there is no revelation. No savior. For them, there is no God. Our universe, on the other hand, is a moral one. Unlike the books of Borges' library, our universe has an author. We have revelation in scripture, a savior in Jesus, and there is a God whose love is the very engine of existence. As small as we are in the infinite vistas of space, God loves us. The author of life cares and weeps when life is taken, whether by a deadly virus or another mass shooting or a fatal traffic stop or on a cross. Peter wants us to understand this that ours is a moral universe authored by God, and therefore we must not repeat or succumb to the violence on display at Golgotha. Repent, he tells us, and turn to God. There is much that we will never understand, no matter how many books we read. But the good book, as it were, tells us enough. It tells us what we really need to know. I suspect that in writing the Library of Babel, Borges was attempting an allegory about our own 
universe, our own reality. And some of it, indeed, may sound chillingly familiar. I know of districts, he laments, in which young men prostrate themselves before books and kiss their pages in a barbarous manner that they do not know how to decipher a single letter. Epidemics, heretical conflicts, peregrinations which inevitably degenerate into banditry have decimated the population. Perhaps my old age and fearfulness deceive me, but I suspect that the human species is about to be extinguished, that the library will endure, illuminated, solitary, indefinite, infinite, perfectly motionless, equipped with precious volumes, useless. That is not our universe. Our universe is not so wretched and bleak. Our universe is one of purpose and meaning, even if we cannot decipher it all. For ours is written by the author of life. And the end of our story is yet to be told. Amen. And now, friends, as you go forth from this place today, may you be blessed by the love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of Jesus Christ, the author of life and of love. Amen.